I want to remind everybody of the importance of giving us little questions. We have a few, and uh, I think I first am to summarize briefly, or at least to wrap up. We covered scales in space and time. You saw a great number of technology developments for imaging, constructing. There are questions you should be asking about how do you put it all together? and a lot of questions about how does a lot of the technology that you've saw developed make it beyond these laboratories where the pioneering is going on to a greater number of sites. You saw a little bit of that so that the community can use these things in extensively. I think that's enough. Jennifer can now take the questions that we've heard and get the speakers one by one to answer questions. Jennifer. So the way we're, we're going to do this is um, I'm going to be uh, t uh, sort of asking questions um, that I've gotten from people uh, related to the first uh, part of the symposium, and Mark will query the second group. So um, actually, let's start with uh, Daniel um, Cullen Ramos. If you could come up here, there's a couple questions for you. Um, so the first uh, question uh, says, is, um, how does architecture and development of the C. elegans brain emerge? Are there fundamental principles that you've been able to see? Right, so <clears throat> for the most part, it's still a mystery. We don't know the, all the organizing principles. We do know some that we have uncovered over the years. Uh, surprising result that we had early on was the discovery that Usually when you form a synapse, a synapse is formed by a presynaptic cell contacting a postsynaptic cell, and that's in every textbook and in every cartoon diagram you can imagine. And the, we discovered that there's a third cell, which is a glia cell, that is acting as a matchmaker. So the, the presynaptic cell is not talking to the postsynaptic cell until the very end. Instead, the glia cell talks to the presynaptic cell and tells it to form synapses. It also, at the same time, talks to the postsynaptic cell and tells it to come to where the presynaptic cell is, and, and then, and then it, it matches them. So that, that's an organizing principle that we think it's going to be conserved, actually has been shown to be conserved and might be important. And uh, one other question relates to um, how, do you, how could you get better imaging? What are the limitations? Um, could you image all movements of um, the worm? Right, so, so we, I'll answer that question by saying that in today's talk, including Jennifer's talk and the, the talks that we just saw, there's, you know, there are different levels of imaging. You can image activity, you can image the tissue, you can image single cells, you can image subcellularly. <clears throat> and I think that that level of understanding is going to be necessary. Uh, we are limited uh, by the number of colors that we have available, which, which I love your talk. I'm talking about the spectral image, and I'm going to go back and look into that. Um, we are also limited by the, the, uh, the, the, the temporal scale. I mean, we can image for prolonged periods of time, which is very enabling right now, but being able also to image for prolonged periods of time at even higher resolution and multiple things at the same time would be fantastic. And that is, uh, come on over, what are the uh, cyclical shape changes in the dendritic spines um, that you had mentioned? And what is the purpose of these changes? What's, what are they correlated with? So um, there are a number of changes that have been described that are associated with development of spines. So as I showed you um, one shot of uh, the Fragile X mouse, where there's a specific protein associated with chaperoning messenger RNA that is mutated, and the spines seem to keep trying to find a partner and never mature into what's the typical mushroom shape. Okay. So part of the variation that you saw in those images has to do with whether or not you're in the process of partnering up 
and you complete the partnering up, then there are activities related to spine enlargement that have been described associated with long-term potentiation. Those are well documented. Some people believe, and there's some evidence in the literature, that there are actomyosin interactions closer to the top of the neck before you get into the bulb part of the spine. So the spine has some actin modulation. Then there are studies uh, just recently published, we participated in these in February in science, showing that uh, if, an, this is from uh, Chiara Sorelli and Tanomi, um, I think I got the name right, uh, showing that dendritic spines, the majority of them shrink by 20% if you've been sleeping about three hours, or at least if a mouse has been sleeping at the time that you harvest the tissue. So predict, and I guess I'm allowed to do that, that spines go through a cycle day, night, and that when you're learning something and your postsynaptic process has been facilitated, it holds that state for a while, but then somehow you have to transfer whatever that information is that's been encoded in the dendrite to stabilize that neuron in a way that that information is stored in that region of the brain. So that so-called downscaling of the response, the LTP response, has to be translated perhaps into differences in the connectivity between those neurons, probably their inhibition by activating uh, synapse formation by the inhibitory interneurons. So that's the kind of state of thinking uh, at this point. The question for Na is, do you see calcium being released from astrocytes in addition to neurons? If so, how are they different? That's a great question. The technology we have can definitely be applied to astrocyte, but we haven't tried that yet. Um, but there is a big community of people who are doing calcium imaging in astrocyte. So, you know, I would imagine <laughs> there must be some difference. I think in general, the time transient is much slower, and it doesn't have this, uh, you know, this stereotypical kind of impulse function shape. And uh, actually, Brain Initiative has a new uh, call for proposal where they would like people to develop probes as well as data analysis uh, method for astrocyte because they, they, do, um, they are behaving quite differently from neuron. But I, I don't have personal experience with it. Okay, next is Eric Jorgensen. Um, can you speculate on what controls ultrafast endocytosis? Um, at the different temperatures? Is it ATP or enzymes? What, what do you think is causing that switch in um, the mode of endocytosis? Right, so we think that the most likely um, change is in the lipid, the nature of the lipids. So as you cool lipids, they will eventually go into a gel-like shape or state, which is, uh, will disallow the sort of shape changes that we think are going on. In particular, PIP2 shows some very bizarre interactions between moving between room temperature and 37 degrees, so the fluidity increases. And so that has something to do with the head group. The second thing we think that is going on is that the fatty acid tails um, that are anchored in the membrane also are having a strong effect. And so uh, particularly for, um, so nematodes live at 20 degrees, that's not a problem. Uh, but if you raise an animal at 25 degrees and you drop, drop it to 20 degrees, it can't move anymore. If you uh, raise an animal at 15 degrees, it moves fine. And so what we are finding is that uh, fatty acid desaturases are uh, what allows these animals to move better at 15 degrees. So in the end, we think it's going to be the head groups of the lipids and the fatty acid tails. Don't go anywhere because you got a couple more questions. Have you attempted electrical stimulation of the synapse that mimics actual, actual, actual action potentials in the axon? If accurate, ex exocytosis would not occur with every stimulation. The number of fused vesicles might be different under these circumstances. 
Yeah, so what we'd love to do is to drive, to clamp the cell um, with a real honest-to-God action potential. Uh, we've, of course, not been able to do that. This is just a simply an electrical stim field stimulation, uh, and it's absolutely possible that the shape of the action potential uh, will have an effect. Certainly the temperature of an action potential will cause it to widen uh, and also causes calcium channels to open slowly. So these are things that we know happen. Uh, and we're not able to do that in our system. You really need to be able to voltage clamp um, those cells, and then uh, you can only do that in the calyx of held or some other of these cells that have large presynaptic terminals. One last question. <laughs> um, if you calculate the depletion of vesicles and the renewal rate, um, is the 30-second endocytosis um, number that you came up with at the low temperature significant? I think the question is, can you actually replenish vesicles um, using clathrin-mediated endocytosis given that there's 200 synaptic vesicles at a, at a, at a hippocampal synapse? And uh, the answer is no, but we don't really know, and it may be worse than that because we're not convinced that all of the vesicles we see by EM um, are actually synaptic vesicles, but rather maybe storage depot, uh, the reserve pools may be um, not actually, even though they look like synaptic vesicles, may not be synaptic vesicles. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark now, who's got questions for the second group of speakers. Jennifer, uh, does organelle interaction estimated by light microscopy match with EM studies? What's the resolution obtained by light microscopy? That's a really great question. Um, the, um, basically, in our, when we created the organelle interactome, um, we counted as a contact or, um, when two organelles share, shared the same pixel, which was 160 nanometers. And that's... Um, you know, fairly big, so, you know, there could be some uh, overlap that was not relevant, but I should emphasize that the tethering proteins that are known to tether two organelles together, um, like the VAC protein that I showed, extend about 100 nanometers or more off from the surface of the organelle of interest. But um, really to that point, uh, one of the things, one of the projects in our lab is uh, we've created uh, fret probes to look at um, fret interactions, which take you down into the nanometric level that's a, that would be approximating um, electron microscopy resolution to map out um, frequency of interactions between different sets of organelles, but we're just doing that two by two. Um, we've yet to calculate the extent of interaction from the electron mic micrograph, micrograph images um, just because of the uh, time that is required to uh, segment all of those organelles, and to do that in a whole cell is still quite challenging. So one, one more while Jennifer's here. Um, what machine learning framework is used to train and evaluate uh, an imaging segmentation in order to build the 3D model? Well, we didn't use any machine learning um, system at this point because some of these organelles, like the ER, um, although we tried to work with people, different people, to see whether there'd be a way that we could train uh, uh, a computational system to learn how to call an ER in a particular slice, uh, it just didn't work. So we did everything by hand at this point. And this is a big area that I think uh, needs further work from the machine learning crowd. Um, so this is a related question not directed to anybody. So uh, are machine learning and deep learning used already to analyze the brain uh, map imaging functionality uh, with what research labs, Kavli, uh, et cetera, plan to collaborate to apply deep learning algorithms? So does anybody want to address that? Um, I can make some comments, and, and Harold can probably. I can start it with, uh, at least my group has worked extensively with uh, different groups, Tolga Tazin and Utah, to do deep learning for organelles successfully at this point. 
many of these approaches, when they're first cooked, require considerable uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, so you have to make a, a template. You have to do the work first by hand in order to have a training data set, in order to let computational processes and algorithms that are being cooked up quite effectively to find at least a solution that's as good as yours. And that's the, the way the judgments are being done. So most of the labs that are doing this still are employing teams of undergraduates supervised by the most effective graduate student or postdoc who manages people kind of like a, a McDonald's crew or whatever to actually get the ground truth then it involves usually using big computers, expensive cycle supercomputers. So a whole, all the ER in a single Purkinje cell done that way initially for us, which I didn't show, was a million CPU hours between the, the training the algorithm and then executing on it. That with computer graphics cards, GPUs, once the software that you've decided works, uh, is shown to work properly, is ported and then it can be made available on a small group of uh, machines that might cost a laboratory ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to put together. So I think that's the direction that it goes. But it's, right now, for example, Genalia is relying on Google to do them a big favor. Okay, so um, that's the machine learning question. Now, uh, this one is for Philip. Uh, do you think you could add four pi capabilities to your four sided light sheet system? First, you have to explain to them what that means. Sure. So, so um, the short answer is yes, you can do that, but it wouldn't make any sense for our experiments. Um, and, and so it, it's, not, it's not an obvious thing, so let me explain. Um, I mean, basically, the four pi approach just means that you have two you know, opposing objectives aimed at the sample. And so actually, one of the slides I showed today relates to the, 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 the interest you might have in, in, in that arrangement, which is that usually you don't collect all of the light you know, with a, with a um, you know, conventional objective with a limited collection angle, li a limited numerical aperture. So ideally, you want the aperture to be as, as big as possible, and ideally, you want to completely envelope your sample. Um, uh, uh, you know, with your detection system, you can really, you know, grab all of the photons uh, you, you can get out of the, out of the specimen, um, which relates to, you know, signal collection efficiency, but also directly to, to spatial resolution. And so with the 4-pi approach, you, um, you know, you just have the 4-pi spatial angle, you have full access. Um, to to uh, to the sample, and you can combine it with other principles such as you know uh, standing structured uh, patterned illumination, um, where you can go to sub wavelength resolution by just having counter propagating waves that injected um, um, through multiple objectives that are facing each other. Um, so there's a lot of potential in, in in having these more complex arrangements, but all of them rely on the concept of of very precise wavefront control. So you're assuming that you will get um, for example, you do the structural nation approach that you can get very precise interference pattern inside the sample and so that you know, you're know you making an assumption about what happens to the light inside the sample. And so for all of the specimens we're looking at, you know, the Trisophila larvae, the zebrafish, uh, the zebrafish brain, the zebrafish brain might, might be probably the closest to, to making this possible, but um, even there, we are really perturbing uh, the beams, we are perturbing the wavefront. And we are, the, the errors that we accumulate in the wavefront are a much larger um, uh, order of magnitude than what level of you know, precise spatial control you would need in order to, to get some resolution enhancing effects uh, to work. Um, so for the most part, we just don't really have enough penetration um, and, and, and control to, to use these approaches. Um, so you can, in the future, you could potentially improve this with, uh, with adaptive optics techniques. Um, so you can sort of bend the light back into shape uh, to some extent by mapping this out. Um, but then there's still the problem of light scattering and so on that is much harder to, to resolve. So I think uh, it's an interesting direction for the future, but right now it's like not the most obvious thing that we would want to push forward. Have you looked at axons in the vicinity of different types of plaques in the Alzheimer brains? 
Okay. Um, well, I'm not a person in uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, so um, we didn't go into very much uh, so the ebetaprax, and but um, so there's um, controversy uh, whether or not you know so which axon or dendrite you know uh, have more you know neuritis. Um, I, I like the the the, the d debate. So. Um, Yes, um, actually, I have to confess, uh, we try to look at the axon, uh, so the involvement of the axon in the product formation. And, uh, well, but um, we didn't do it, uh, do that very much yet. Mm, but uh, I'm glad somebody asked me. Uh, we, had, <laughs> we hope to do it. I asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, um, <clears throat> so we, we tried to, to dis dis distinguish just the axon and the dendrite so by some ways, and um, we didn't get any uh, good so the antibodies, um, but we need them. Yeah, you can do it. So. To, to turn this into a brief discussion, so part of the problem is that the axons that go to the vicinity of the neuritic plaques, this is from analyzing biopsy samples that we did 35 years ago, is that, of course, the microtubules have depolymerized and tau is now stuck in the soma, so the markers that you'd normally use to say that's an axon are not there, but if you look ultrastructurally, the, pla the plaque area is toxic to the axons, and then you have retrograde degeneration, okay? So if there were another marker rather than the traditional markers, or if you could do it with an animal that had some sort of labeled lipids of the, of the membrane, uh, you might see it in a more effective way than the small samples that we did in the, I would call it the dark ages. So maybe I add one more thing. Um, so we are um, now more interested in uh, diffuse prax than quad prax. So the quad prax have very nice uh, clear boundary. Mm -hmm. So maybe cr uh, proximity uh, c c can be uh, analyzed uh, in, in depth. But uh, diffuse prax uh, have a very ambiguous, a big boundary, so it's more challenging. So concerning the, the interaction with other ob object. So um, yeah, quad prax are uh, maybe good target. Yeah, mm -hmm. lo lo longer discussion maybe with DIY or something. Um, so this, I think this is the last question and it's for uh, Alapashi. Uh, so, I love this question, I didn't ask it. Uh, please comment on the relationship of your finding to the field of mathematical modeling of neuronal dynamics. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, the, I, I don't know exactly how to answer this question because it is quite broad. So what I, what I can say is that um, we hope that our methods um, provide at least within some constraints the the information that can be then used for um, various modeling approaches. So one thing I can say is that um, one thing uh, that we are trying to do with the, uh, is related to cortical computation. So there, there is an ongoing project that is aimed at um, recording the entire cortical column, map it, map the dynamic onto the structural information that we can get via electron microscopy um, to confine a model and then try to build a, a generative computational models that would be describing the dynamic and thereby uh, work towards the algorithms that are, for instance, underlying as, the, as that animal has been engaged in an object recognition task and trying to see whether we can work backwards. But um, this is all I can say at this moment. So I think with that, unless someone wants to uh, make an airplane out of a card and send it up here pretty fast, we've gotten through all the questions that came from cards, which puts Nick Spitzer on for a in-depth summary of the meeting. <laughs>
Well, we, we are approaching the, the end of our day, and, and a very exciting day it's been. Uh, you put it very well earlier, Mark, uh, characterizing this as a uh, very illuminating experience, and I think that's an understatement, illuminating across scales of time, across uh, scales of space. Uh, and uh, uh, Ali Pasha, I liked your response to that uh, last question, because I think that with new tools, we uh, see an ever more um, expanded uh, scope the way in which neurons and other cells that some claim have an important role uh, are, are interacting uh, in the brain. And this then leads us, as it, it, it led you, to um, suggest that there may be reorganization on different time scales and spatial scales of activity that we did not guess at without actually being able to see the larger scale of, of data. So there are many people to thank here. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank particularly uh, Jennifer and uh, Mark for uh, bringing us together here and, and organizing the symposium. Uh, I want to uh, particularly thank uh, the featured speakers, all of them spectacular uh, and really exciting data that uh, is uh, fun, to, fun, to, fun to watch. And uh, I do want to take a quick moment to thank again the KIBM staff. I think they're probably uh, no longer with us, but they have done a fantastic job. Uh, uh, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes putting, putting this together for us. And finally, I want to thank all of you in the audience uh, for attending, for your interest, and for your questions. Uh, it's been a, been a great day. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and we hope that uh, you'll be back uh, in the future for a, uh, a series of future KIBM symposia. Uh, thanks again.